uh, put a break on conflicts, I, I think the effect will be really, really bad. Because number one, these conflicts have not stopped. As, as I said earlier, they are continuing, even as COVID-19 COVID is, is ongoing. And they, we will most likely lose everything we've worked for uh, in, in, in the past years. So I would say that this is look at COVID-19 as a threat multiplier. And let's double down in our efforts and say, yes, we will deal with this COVID-19, but we'll also ensure that other efforts uh, at uh, conflict, uh, particularly at managing conflicts, are maintained. Because diseases really do so well in areas where there is silence, where people are not talking. And conflicts breed silence because of trust issues. If you want people to tackle COVID-19 effectively, you will want effective communication. You will want people to cooperate. You will want people to come together. Conflict does not allow for the building of social capital, for those people to come together and do these things. So if you take your foot off the gas now, it will be worse. You know, we are in the U.S., we are in the middle of a crisis, another crisis with race relations and systemic racism and just ongoing protest um, with everything that's been going on with police violence. And I could not help but think about the parallel of the conversation we're having here with the dynamic that we're seeing in the U.S. And I wonder if you have been reflecting on that dynamic um, based on what you know of the mitigation work you've done in other places and yeah, how you're rep, repping, repping around this issue. As I reflected in class on Monday, we started the humanitarian course with the uptick of like COVID and that there was in essence a humanitarian response in this country. And we closed class on Monday after a night of pretty bad looting um, that, that distracted from the important protests that were happening. And I had walked around my neighborhood that morning and just saw all the damage that had been done. And it was an interesting kind of bookcasing of the course. And there has been talk of, you know, UN resolutions against the U.S. What would humanitarian intervention mean here? Or if that UN resolution got passed, I mean, it won't, at least at the Security Council. So definitely at the more high level had been thinking about it. What I've been thinking actually at the intersection of COVID and this issue is just a complete lack of trust with um, communities and government and how what's happening now is even going to make that worse. And so we likely will have another spike of COVID and how much harder it will be to have those social distancing measures taken up. And so, you know, seeing in my neighborhood how people are not all obeying the rules already and we're one day out of lockdown. And so that's to me, is just how incredibly, like the, just the lack of trust in institutions here now. And so much of the peace building work I've done with Maurice over the years has been about trying to connect communities to institutions. Absolutely. We need interventions in the U.S. very badly as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I mean, just to add that, you know, um, We've had similar challenges in my country back in Kenya. I've seen similar challenges in other countries I've worked and in Nigeria currently. And I, I think apart from you know, building those strong institutional networks and connections and relationships that um, uh, Rebecca has talked about, one thing that we continuously challenge people to think about, but which for some strange reason, everybody's afraid of and we, I mean, we can also see it in the in the U.S. now. Is you know getting familiar with what our emotions teach us uh, when we go through some of these you know challenges, uh, when we hurt one another, and you know because when we don't really acknowledge shame and its reasons for it, or when grief goes underground and gets twisted, you know when we don't have avenues for uh, you know response whether it's embodied or not, or, you know, but some kind of avenue for response 
or when we think that it's for other people over there, you know, then get, things get strange and harmful. And, and I think that particularly as, as, as humanity, we are not even very practiced at perceiving it as harm currently. You know, it reminds me, it's like those people, you know, commenting with such uh, compassion for the dog in the video of Ami Cooper, if you've, if you've seen that. It, it's some kind of twisted, you know, shame and empathy. And we continuously, you know, we lose our capacity to respond to such things. It happens continuously and continuously, and our response is not authentic. Yeah? And, and it's not authentic, and it's not from a place of connectedness. And we, we continue hurting one another. I see it right now among the Christians and Muslims in, in, in Nigeria. I see it, you know, between and among ethnic communities in Kenya, whether it is Luos and Kikuyus. And now I see it in this, you know, this, uh, you know, situation in the U.S. Uh, you know, it's some kind of twisted shame that cuts off connection. Uh, so we don't have to perceive it as such, but it actually hurts us. So we need to really be able to be familiar with our emotions and confront them, you know, across lines. We should not be ashamed of talking about some of these things. Briefly tell us, like, what are the next steps? How is this project going to follow? Do you have already the funds? What's going to happen? Oh, thanks. Yeah, so we already have the money. <laughs> we have the funds to, <laughs> to, to conduct the study, and we have already started with the study. I think... Uh, We've already trained a group of uh, community mediators and deployed them. And some of them, I think in one state, where we managed to collect initial data, they've already, uh, I think, resolved 125 disputes. We already have communities, you know, control and uh, test communities in place. So the study is ongoing. I think going forward right now is to see, uh, to conduct uh, a mid-term uh, test to see where we are with things. We are actually interviewing community leaders in control areas so that we get to know also what is their capacity levels and how they see things so that it will enable effective comparison. Uh, then we'll do a midterm evaluation. And uh, at the end of the year, we will now start adding more activities to you know, what we are doing right now and keep testing uh, and see eventually what we get. Um, we're in about the first year of a five-year program. And often you get results of studies like this after the program is over. And because we're doing it at the early part of the program, we'll be able to feed in the results of the study to it, be able to adapt it so and learn from that. And then, as Maury said, we're adding different components to be able to also look at the differential effects of these various components. One of the challenges of many development and peace building programs today is that it has multiple components. And so you don't know what's having most impact on your results. And so after the first year of implementation, we'll add in those dialogues. So kind of the more contact part of the program and see what the added effect uh, is of the relationship building component in addition to mediation. And so those results would come, say, two years out. But that's, it's nice to be able to do it as a more iterative process versus just you run a five-year study, and then about a year after the study, the program is over, you then find out what it did. And no one who was involved in the program is around anymore. Uh, so it's very much more of a learning approach we've been able to take here. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was a lovely chat. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Root of Conflict, featuring Maurice Amolo and Rebecca Wolf. Special thanks to our interviewers, Daniela Choi and Daniel Vallejo, and to UC3P and the Pearson Institute for their continued support of this series. To learn more about the Pearson Institute's research and events, visit thepearsoninstitute.org and follow them on Twitter.